everyone, and welcome to today's QI Power Hour session. This is Chelsea Schwartz, Provincial Improvement Consultant with the Health Quality Council. QI Power Hour is a free monthly WebEx offering hosted by the Saskatchewan Health Quality Council. QI Power Hour provides opportunity for colleagues across healthcare as well as other industries to hear from local and national improvement experts on a variety of quality improvement related topics. Just a reminder that these sessions are recorded and posted to the Health Quality Council's website to allow access to our colleagues who are not able to join the webinar today. As we're using a teleconference line in conjunction with our webinar today, please note that we require all participants to mute their lines. Please do not use the mute function on your phone as this sometimes is on the line. Please press star six to mute your line and star six again to unmute if you would like to ask a question in the Q&A. I'll give everyone a moment now to make sure their lines are muted. These sessions are designed to be fun, interactive learning sessions, so we encourage your participation on today's webinar. We encourage you to use the chat function during today's session to share your questions, comments, and ideas. You'll find the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. You can access the chat function by clicking on the on the top right-hand side of your screen. Our presenter today uh, has built in some time for, for some interactive components, so we'll invite your, your comments and your questions in the chat during this time. Uh, but please feel free to message either myself, Chelsea, or the HQC host at any point during the session uh, if you have any technical issues or have any questions. Let's take a moment to practice this function by typing in the name of your organization you're joining us today from. All right, people are in Friday mode already, I see. Uh, but we'll invite you to, to locate your chat function, uh, and you can, you can start practicing by typing in um, the name of your organization. Sunrise, Surya Health, Manitoba Health, thank you. <laughs> Heartland, perfect, thanks everyone. So we also encourage you to use Twitter today as you listen to today's session. Uh, use hashtag QI Power Hour and the handle HQC staff. In addition to representation from all 13 of our health regions in the province, we've also seen participation in QI Power Hour from other healthcare agencies as well as other organizations with an interest in quality improvement. We've also excited to uh, begin to see spread to other organizations within Canada and even abroad. So I'd just like to take a moment to welcome everyone to QI Power Hour this morning. And with that, I'll pass it over to the this morning, uh, Doug Campbell and Laura Schwartz. Thanks, Chelsea. So today's session is looking at understanding variation and how to identify and manage variation. So some of you will recall that this is the second presentation on variation that's been uh, done in the QI Power Hour. The first session looked at what is variation and what types of variation there are. And today we're going to look at how you identify variation, uh, what strategies you use to reduce variation once it's been identified. A couple key points from our first session, there are two types of variation, common cause, which is a stable and predictable process, and special cause, which is an unstable and unpredictable process. Another thing we chatted about quite a bit is that reducing variation in healthcare is improving the system. So I'd like to quickly introduce myself. My name is Laura Schwartz, and I'm a researcher at the Health Quality Council, focusing primarily in the area of appropriate and my name is Doug Campbell. I'm a Provincial Improvement Consultant at HCC, and I usually work in the area of health system planning and reporting. So today our goals are to describe the parts of a control chart, understand how to read a control chart, and cover effective improvement strategies for managing variation once you've identified the type. Where does this fit our past presentations? This is the fifth one in a line dating back to 2015, with of course, the most recent one being our first presentation on variation done back in March 2017. Just so we know where this fits with the model for improvement, there's a couple ways that understanding variation can help you in your uh, quality improvement journey. First of all, it's useful to identify a problem that you might have within your system, but it's also helpful looking at variation to know whether or not a change that you've implemented has resulted in an improvement or not. Quick reminder from last time is that uh, variation in healthcare uh, 
are enemies, really. Uncontrolled variation is the enemy of quality, and controlling it is critical to quality improvement. And understanding variation in data will allow us to determine if there's an issue and if changes are needed to improve care provided to our patients. So let's dive right in and talk a little bit about what tools we can use to see variation. The first one is um, our most basic tool, and it's a run chart. Probably most people on the call today have seen a run chart, but simply put, it's the graphical representation of data plotted in time order. There's a few things about the run chart that um, are on every run chart that we want to cover today. First of all, time is always plotted on the x-axis. Your measure of interest is plotted on the y-axis. We always find a median or a center line. And finally, annotations are often added to help us understand what's happened in the process. So for example, here I put in that a change was trialed in April of 2006. And from that, we can look to see whether there's any changes in the data based on changes that have been trialed. When should we use a run chart? Well, it's useful to determine how much variation exists in the system. Uh, it can help us to display our data to make the process or system uh, performance visible. It's also useful to know whether or not changes have resulted in an improvement. And if those changes have resulted in an improvement, whether or not the gains we've made are being sustained or if they start to slip away after a little while. When we're analyzing run charts, we have four rules that we use that are based in probability. The shift, trend, number of runs, and astronomical. And if we have any evidence of these rules, we can be 95% certain that a signal is happening. Now, we covered uh, run charts in a power hour last summer. We spent a whole, a whole hour on it. So this is the most I'm going to tell you about run charts. It was just a quick summary to let you know uh, where we kind of start off when we're looking at variation. But if you're interested in viewing the full power, it's located on HQC's website here. So now I'm going to talk about what the key tool is for identifying variation. <clears throat> um, and that is control charts. So just a really quick reminder about common and special cause variation, because they're important when we're using control charts. So common cause variation are those causes that are inherent in a system over time. They will affect everyone that's working in the system, and they'll affect all outcomes. They result in a process that's considered stable or predictable. Contrast that to special cause variation, where the causes are not part of the system all the time, they don't affect everyone, and they arise because of special circumstances. This results in an unstable process that is not predictable. So far, we've really focused our energy on diagnosing our current state and used tools that help to diagnose our systems, using things like Pareto charts, histograms, scatter plots, and then, of course, the run chart that we just talked about. What is the main problem or issue that all managers, leaders, and quality improvers face in healthcare? And that is predictions. All leaders have difficulty predicting what in the future with their performance systems. By using data and control charts, predictions can be made about what the system might look like in the future. If we understand if a measure is, um, of interest is stable or unstable, then we know, sorry, excuse me, if a measure is stable, then we know it is predictable into the near future or across the system. If a measure is unstable, it's not stable, and in this case, leaders sometimes over or undercompensate resources. The tool that we use for understanding variation to see if it's stable or unstable is a Schuhart. Sometimes it's just called a Schuhart chart, sometimes it's called a control chart. Um, today we're going to just call it a control chart, but if you hear Schuhart, they're the same thing. There's two common mistakes that often happen. Mistake number one is thinking that an outcome is due to special cause when it was truly due to common cause. For example, we can make this mistake if we're looking at each month's admissions and try to find one reason why they were up or down. Mistake number two is thinking that an outcome is due to common cause when it was really due to, to a special cause. So for example, we could make this mistake by never looking at reasons for change in admission numbers and assuming that the changes are always due to normal or common cause variation in the healthcare system. Control, control charts help to minimize these two mistakes by making it easy to identify whether variation is common cause or special cause. And this picture, this clear picture um, makes interpreting the data easier and helps us to draw the proper conclusions on what the next step for improvement activity is because depending on what type of variation we have, um, our improvement strategies are different. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. 
This is just a really quick graphical representation of what control charts try to do. So where this circle is, is where control charts try to minim minimize the chances of mistake number one and mistake number two happening when we're looking at our data. What is a control chart? What does it look like? Well, a control chart is really just an advanced version of a run chart, and it's used to distinguish between variation and measure due to common cause. Just like a run chart, the data is still plotted over time, and it still has a center line. However, when we use a control chart, just based on the mathematics that have been used to develop it, we use the mean instead of the median. And then probably the most defining feature about a control chart is that there's statistically cal calculated upper and lower control limits that, of course, are based on minimizing mistake number one and mistake number two. Here's what a control chart looks like. So if you look here, we have our upper control limit in the red dotted line, our lower control limit in the red dotted line. Of course, the median, or pardon me, not the median, the mean is here. And time is still plotted on the x-axis and your uh, measure of interest on the y-axis. A little bit of um, mathematical background on where uh, control charts come from. So control charts are based on the statistics of random distributions. So a static distribution of data, like a bell curve or a normal distribution, when it's rotated on its side, will show the distri distribution of points on a control chart over time. So more points are going to be towards um, the mean, and there will be less points as you go further and further out to the outside edges of the chart. Um, Based on statistics, if there is a point that's outside of these control limits, it's statistically unlikely that that is due to random chance. There's probably something special happening in our system. And I just want to make a note that although I've said that it's based on normal distribution, you don't need data that is normally distributed in order to create a run chart. There's lots of different control charts that you see here um, that are based on different types of data and different types of distributions. Today we're not going to focus on which chart you use for which data, um, we're just going to focus on understanding control charts and reading them. However, if there's interest in the future, we could do another QI Power Hour on um, identifying what type of chart you would use for what type of data. One more quick thing on some t statistics about control charts. Um, Control charts are based on signal limits. They have a basis in statistical theory, and they're proven in practice to distinguish between common cause and special cause variation. Um, it's really, really important for you to know that control charts are calculated by placing the upper control limit three sigma limits above the mean and the lower control limit at three sigma, sigma limits below the mean. This is different from standard deviations. You cannot use standard deviations to create control charts. You need to use sigma limits. Um, by using sigma limits, this minimizes the total cost due to overreaction and underreaction to variation. And it also protects the morale of the worker in the process by defining the magnitude of the variation that is built into the process. So by that we mean that the sigma isn't as sensitive as a standard deviation, and therefore it will not overestimate the amount of special cause in a system. If common cause variation is present, this is just what the system has been designed to produce. And now I'm going to pass it over to Doug to walk us through the five rules for understanding and interpreting control charts. Thanks, Laura. So in order to understand control charts, there's five rules that you're looking at to see if there's special cause variation in your process. And those rules are, the first one is the point outside the limits, a shift, a trend, two out of three, and 15 points hugging the central line. So if you're familiar with the run chart rules, you'll notice a bit of overlap there, but they are slightly different for control charts. So the first rule is the point outside the limits, and that's just as simple as you think it sounds. So this is a data point that falls outside the upper or lower control limits. So in this graph below, we're seeing a point right there that's falling above the upper control limit. So that means there's special cause in this system. The second rule is a shift. This is eight or more consecutive points, either all above or all below the mean. So when we're counting, we still want to skip values that are on the mean and then we would continue counting. Values that are on the mean don't make a shift or break a shift, they basically just don't count, so just ignore them. So here's an example of what that looks like in practice. So I would go along counting, and I'd see a couple above here, but then note below so I don't have anything. But once I get over here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points in a row all above the mean. So I know there's a shift in my process here, so something has happened cause special cause in our system, and I'd want to dig into that to understand why. The third rule is a trend, 
and this is six points all going up or all going down consecutively. There is a little bit of a side note on this one, and that is if there's two values in a row or more that are the same, you only count that as one point. So if I have four values in a row that are all the same, that only counts as one. And these like values don't make or break a trend. Again, you just ignore them. So here's what a trend looks like. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six points in a row, all going down in this one. So that's our special cause trend. We want to understand what's happening in our system to change that. Because maybe that's a good thing, but in this example, it's a bad thing. Our average patient satisfaction score has a trend in the downward direction, which I'm sure is not what we're looking for. The fourth rule is the two out of three rule. And this is about having two out of three consecutive points in the outer third of a chart. So these points can either be on the same side of the mean or on either side of the mean. So I'll show you what that looks like. So in this example here at the start, we've got two out of three points in the outer third of the chart there, so I know there's special cause. Because it's very unlikely, according to the mathematics, that you'd have the two points that close to the control line. Here's an example on later in the chart that shows one below the mean and one above the mean. So we still have two out of three points in those outer third of the chart, so we know that the process is starting to go out of control. There's special cause here, and we want to understand why. So it's no longer predictable. Fifteen points hugging the central line is, again, just as simple as that sounds. It's 15 points within the inner third of the chart. So this basically means that the variation has left your process. So while that might be a very good thing, you'd want to understand why that happened. If it was because of a change you implemented, or if it's something that you're not sure of why it's happening, but it's a good thing that you might want to dig into and replicate. So just to note, with the two out of three rule and the 15 point hugging the central line rule, it is something you can use your just sort of the, the eyeballs and your feel to do it, but if you want, you can absolutely do the mathematics, figure out what those signal limits are, and know exactly where those points should lie. But usually just using your eyes will give you a pretty good indication of if there's two out of three or 15. So this chart actually has both. So there's 15 hugging here, but there's two out of three over here. Actually, it's two out of four, but that's the general thought. You use your eyeballs and look at it. So what does it mean if I see a special cause rule? Well, it means something in the process has changed. So this might be evidence of improvement. If a trend in the data in the desired direction, that's a good thing. But it also might be a bad thing or an unintended thing. Seeing a shift or a trend in the data that's going away from the way we want it to be going, that would be a degradation in our results. We want to dig in. We can remove that special cause from the system. So what does it mean if you only see common cause in the system? It could mean a couple of different things. The first thing it might mean is if you're doing PDCA cycles and you're trying to change your process, but so it's still only common cause, it probably means that those changes have not yet resulted in improvement. So you might want to reevaluate what you're trying out. Another way that the system might stay in common cause is if you made an improvement and now you're holding those gains. So that's shown in the graph below here. We, the system changed because we made an improvement and now we're showing common cause in this area of the chart. So an important note is that we only need one of those five rules to appear in order for it to be a special cause system. So I don't need two, I don't need three, I certainly don't need all five, and it'd be very unlikely you would ever see that. So if you see one of those rules, it means that there's something that's odd about that system. It's significant. There's something special happening in that system that you'd either want to dig into, eliminate, dig into, and replicate. I someone thought that was funny. So now it's your turn. Uh, just a reminder to hit star six if you want to get your phone, but if you don't, that's okay too, but we'll try to keep moving. So your turn. We're going to analyze this chart together, so if you can use the chat function to put your answers in, that would be fantastic, or if you'd like to speak up on this Friday morning before a long weekend, feel free. Uh, so let's go through all of the rules, which is just good practice to analyze a chart. So the first thing we're going to do is look at this chart and see if there's a point outside the limit. Put that on. An upper control limit here at 633. We've got a lower control limit here yeah. at 236. Mm -hmm. Do you see any points outside those limits? Do we see special cause in that way? I can be stubborn and wait until someone puts an answer in. Or, Well, thank you very much, Francesco. I agree. There's no special cause there. Now the second rule we'll look for is a shift. So now we're looking for either eight points in a row above or eight points in a row below the median. So I'll do this one with you. So we can count, no, one above, one below. Well, now we've got a few above. So we've got one, two, three, 
four, five points above, that's certainly not eight, then we break our shift there. So no, we don't have a shift yet. Got four in a row here, but no, it goes below, so there's no shift. But now we've got that shift going on here. I think we have nine points that are below the median, so we definitely have a shift right there. Does anyone see a trend? We're looking for six in a row, either going down consecutively or going up consecutively. And I agree, I don't see any trends. 15 around the center line, I think that one's pretty obvious. If we use the old eyeball test, I don't see that. And I don't see two out of three either. So I'm gonna say we only have the one special cause indicator in the system, but we still have special cause. So we'd wanna dig into and understand what happened in order to reduce our days from entry uh, to job placement. So this would be a good change in our process as signified by good is down. So we'd wanna understand what happened in order to make that happen. And if it was because of a PDA, PDSA cycle, we might want to put an annotation on this chart that says change implemented. Here's a more complicated example. So this one might actually uh, make you work a little harder than that last example that was pretty obvious. So let's go through those rules again. Any points outside the limits? Perfect. A couple people saying no, I totally agree. What about shifts? Do we see either eight points in a row above or below the mean? This one's gonna be a little tricky. I'll do it with you. So, no, one below, obviously not. But now we've got one, two, three. We don't count this one below, or we don't count this one because it's on the mean. We've got four, but then we break it again. Over here, we've got five, six, because we've got one, the one on the mean doesn't count. Two, three, four, five, six, and then we break it. Over here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven. One on the mean doesn't count, break it for eight. So there's no shift there, even though that looks like there might have been a shift above, and that does happen over here. Oh, um, okay. Again, just a reminder to mute your lines if you can. There's just a bit of background noise. So thank you for that. Uh, what about a trend? Do we see any trends on this graph? We're looking for six points yeah. in a row. They're going up. We're going down. If there's like values, we're going to ignore them. It's a step worse thing. The conference is in lecture mode. No apologies for that, but just in order for everyone to enjoy the webinar, we're going to mute whoever was speaking on the line. So, okay, so we've got Fatima saying yes. The trend begins on one sixteen. So let's go through that. We've got one, two, three. Actually. This drops, so that breaks our trend. But now we can start over again. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six for a trend. These points are at that same value, so we wouldn't count them, but we already know we're seeing a trend. But now it continues to go up. So we actually have nine points in a row that show where there's a trend. So we would want to look at that and see that there's special cause. And we'd want to understand why, because this is a good thing. We're trying to improve our patient satisfaction score, I would imagine. We've got a trend going in our desired direction. So this is a good thing. We want to understand what, what we did to make that happen. So what we actually might do in that last example is if we notice that trend and it looks like our process has changed based on some more data that we've collected. So that last chart sort of ended around here. Let's say we continued collecting data and we noticed that it was staying well above that mean. So we probably would have seen a shift as well after that trend. What I might want to do is reevaluate my control limits to, based on the new process. So this is what that would look like in practice. So there are some best practices for deciding whether or not to revise the limits on your control chart. And so there's four different rules, and I'll go through them quickly with you now. So the first rule is that when trial limits have been used, you would want to recalculate them once you have 20 data points. So normally best practice is if you collect 12 data points, you can set trial limits. But then once you collect eight more to have 20, you'd want to reevaluate your limits at that point because that's what you'd want to use going forward. So once you set those limits at 20 points, you would extend your mean out, you'd extend those control lines out, and then you'd plot the rest of your data as it comes so that you can see if there's special cause over time. The second idea for reevaluating control limits is if that initial set of data that you were using had special cause in it, but there's a desire to still use the rest of those data points to calculate limits, what you would want to do is basically ignore that one data point that's special cause, so this one, and recalculate it without that. So you 
you'll notice when we, if we calculated the limits using this higher point, it would put our upper control limit at 661. But if we calculated it without that point, because we maybe dug into this special cause and removed it and we're comfortable with that, it actually puts our control limit at 630. So that makes it them a little narrower, so we're more likely to catch that special cause if it happens. So that's another good practice. The third rule is that, same as I was sort of explaining before I went into the rules, if we've made improvements to the process and we're seeing them sustained, then we would want to reevaluate those control limits. So best practice around this is if you see a shift, which is eight or more points, you may want to consider reevaluating those uh, control limits, but to see sustained change, best practice that we've learned was to use 12 points that are all above and uh, above or below the mean. So that's called persistent change. So if there's persistent change in your system, you'd want to reevaluate those control limits so that you can use them to evaluate your new process. Notice there's a couple spelling mistakes on this slide. My apologies. Um, the control chart remains unstable for 20 or more points. You might also need to reevaluate con your control limits. So if you're noticing there's a lot of variation and you've been trying to remove that special cause but you just can't figure out how to do it, it might mean that your process has just become a lot more variable. So that's shown in this chart. that We've got a whole section here that's become very random. We have lots of special cause going on. But if we can't eliminate it and it's just a new process that has a ton of variation in it, well, we might want to reevaluate those limits. Now look how wide they are. So we can expect our values to be anywhere in this limit. It's predictable, but that's just a huge range. We want to go and both try to improve that. If we're seeing that, we might need to totally redesign the system as opposed to just doing small-scale PD PDSAs. Okay, so now that we know how to identify whether or not we have common or special cause variation, I'm now going to chat a little bit about uh, what you, what sorts of um, improvement activities you undertake once you've identified the variation. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about common cause variation. Why do we want to improve common cause variation? What's the purpose? It's stable, right? So why do we need to change anything? Well, let's just take a quick look at this chart. This data is stable, but I'm not sure I would consider this to be a good situation. This is the time waiting for an inpatient bed at some of our busiest hospitals in Saskatchewan. And currently, patients are waiting between 18 and 28 hours for an inpatient bed. So although this process is predictable, it's probably not good, and it should probably be improved upon. Another example I can give on this is, let's say my systolic blood pressure is ranging predictably somewhere between 150 and 160. It's predictable, but way too high and needs to be improved. So what should we do to improve um, common cause variation? Well, you need to determine what in your process might be impacting common cause variation. So with our time waiting for an inpatient bed example, it could be because the hospital is just at such a high capacity that those patients need to wait in the emergency room in order to get their inpatient bed. Once you've decided what part of the process needs to be altered, you should trial a change. So by that, do a PDSA cycle. Trial a change, collect some data, reflect on the data, and determine if the change has improved the process. Obviously, I'm making this sound really simple. These are just the simple steps you follow. Um, decreasing time waiting for an inpatient bed, I know, is very complex and can take a long time. Things you should avoid doing when you're managing your common cause variation is avoid tampering or using what we call special cause management strategies with common cause variation. And I'll go into this a bit more detail right away. Also avoid attaching specific meaning to fluctuations in data. So just because there's a high point in the data, if it's common cause variation, it's predictable. Don't spend too much time digging into that one high point because it's predictable. It's statistically predictable by your system. And then, of course, of course, avoid doing nothing at all. So don't, don't leave your systolic blood pressure at 160. That would not be good for your health. So a little more on tampering. Tampering occurs when you, have a com when you have common cause variation, but you react to it as if it's special cause and make adjustments at multiple steps. The following is an example from Intermountain Healthcare of what can happen when you tamper with common cause variation. So this is a real situation that happened that has real data. Um, this chart shows the INR of a patient with diabetes and a heart condition over time. So ideally what we'd like to see is the INR be in the range of these two green lines here. However, as you can see, the INR jumps around quite a bit, but this is a control chart. So we have our upper control limit here and our lower control limit here. 
And based on those rules, this is a common cause system. It's predictable. So we need to be using common cause strategies to improve the INR of this patient. Unfortunately, what this physician did was used, um, was tampered with the system, used some special cause uh, management strategy, strategies, and reacting to every INR measurement. So the INR measurement was at five, so they, excuse me, was at three, so they changed the warfarin dose up to five. That changed the INR measurement quite a bit. And they did this throughout the process over, I'm not sure if this is 25 days or 25 weeks, but they really reacted to almost every INR measurement. And it caused the process to become even more unpredictable than it was. Uh, the process capability was 60%, so only 60% of the time was the INR falling in the targeted range. Luckily, this physician uh, fixed his mistake and used his common cause management strategy in the next uh, time. He set his warfarin dose at 3.0 for either 16 days or 16 weeks, I'm not sure, and this really evened out his process. Uh, his process capability became 94%, so 94% of the time uh, the data fell in that targeted range for INR. And this is just one reason that's really compelling as to why you need to choose your management strategy properly when you're dealing with common cause and special cause variation. Uh, if the wrong management strategy is chosen, it can really be quite detrimental to the health of the patient. So you need to choose the right one once you've identified your common cause or special cause variation. So I'm going to use, oh, sorry, one more thing on common cause variation for an example. So just what it might look like once on a control chart once you improved your common cause. So looking at patient satisfaction scores, through here we have common cause. Nothing special is happening. But a trial has been changed to um, improve our patient satisfaction, and this has resulted in special cause. It's shifted our data up above the mean. Um, so this is where you might reevaluate those control limits uh, and change your um, change your chart in order to see what happens next with your data over with patient satisfaction. Now looking at managing uh, special cause variation, I'm going to use this stroke uh, data as an example. So this is uh, the door to needle or um, when a patient arrives at a hospital and receives TPA drug, which is a clot busting drug in stroke. Ideally what you want is patients to receive this drug within 30 to 60 minutes of arriving at the hospital because with a stroke time is brain and they need to get this TPA as quickly as possible. However, I see two special cause data points right here that are quite far outside the limits um, with these patients getting their TPA somewhere upwards of two hours. And when I've dug into this data a little bit more, I've determined that these patients were walk-in strokes. So instead of arriving at the hospital via an ambulance, they walked in and therefore this has impacted their TPA time. So we're just going to explore this a little bit more when we look at the management strategies for special cause. So what we need to do is identify the data point that is likely special cause, or it's often the outlier, and trace it back to the root cause. So like I chatted about with the stroke, um, that root cause was due to the fact that the patients were walk-in strokes, and perhaps the uh, nurses in the triage were not identifying the, the patient as having a stroke. Once the root cause is eliminated or identified, work to eliminate it. So what maybe could happen is um, different strategies or standard work needs to be put in place to help nurses triage patients that are potentially having a stroke uh, the first time they come in. Or probably what also needs to be done is some community, community around stroke. Um, if you are having a stroke, you should really call 911 and have an ambulance bring you into the hospital and not arrive yourself. So determine how to stop the special cause from happening again, either by returning to your original process or improving the process overall. What you should avoid doing is avoid failing to include individuals or groups who are involved in the process that have knowledge of the variation. So one more quick anecdote I have about this from Intermountain Healthcare is uh, at one point they were working on a quality improvement in sepsis in patients in hospital, and they had a lot of special cause variation. And they were unable to figure out what was causing the special cause until uh, one of the team members noticed that there was no phlebotomist on the team. They pulled the phlebotomist in, the phlebotomist was able to identify what was causing the special cause, and uh, they were able to stable out their process. And then, of course, as before, avoid doing nothing at all. So I'm just going to pause here and uh, check in with people. From you, you the conference is no longer in lecture mode. You can either use the chat function or the, over the phone. Let us know how you can relate the information you've learned up to this point to your own work and how you might be able to use it. Hopefully everybody's doing particularly well. 
Chloe, Patty on Friday. So we've taken you off of lecture mode, so if you want to use the conference line, feel free. Also, star six to take yourself off of mute in case you need to do that as well. So is someone in the chat uh, useful for a no-show project we're working on in primary care? So yeah, that was you're collecting data on how many people are no-showing every week or every day or whatever it happens to be. If you put that in a control chart, you'd be able to see if your process is stable, if it's predictable of how many people are going to no-show. And then you'd also be able to tell if, based on whatever PDCAs you're trying, if they're actually affecting that number. So you'd be able to identify that special cause. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little bit of something to, to think on here, and then maybe we can check back in after this next section of the presentation. So in this section, I'm going to go through a couple of scenarios with you to show how useful control charts can be for leaders in decision making and for QI folks to know in their, if their efforts are making a change. Uh, so before I get into this, there's a question. Uh, do we always start with three sigma control lines? Uh, so yes, we always start with three sigma control limits. There's only two control lines, so depending on what your question was asking. So we've got that upper control line and that lower control line, and we always want to put those on once we have 12 data points or more. And there are always three sigma limits away from the mean. So they'll be the exact same distance to the upper one as to the lower one from the mean. So hopefully that covers anything you might have been wondering about. So how do control charts and targets work together? So in this province, we have a ton of targets around healthcare, which is a good thing. If we're working to improve something, we want to have a goal of where we want to be. But I do want to note that when we're looking at targets and merging that with a control chart, it can lead to a little bit of confusion. And that's because of the fact that as human beings, it's normal for us to want to put things into distinct groups so that we can understand them. So the way we normally do that in healthcare is, is something red or is something green? That's been the most common way to look at data in our daily huddle boards all the way up to the PLT wall walks. So when something is green, it's good, and usually, honestly, we ignore it. When something's red, it's bad, and we tend to treat it as a special cause. So we go out and chase down that problem of why it's red, and we try and do something about it. So we're expending a lot of resources trying to do that. But in the spirit of continuous improvement, I'm going to show you what might be a next step in the evolution of our understanding of whether we're achieving our targets or not. So here's an example of the percent of budget spent on direct client care. So based upon the rules we've learned for control charts, what do you guys see when you look at this? Feel free to shout it out or type it in the chat. This one isn't meant to be tricky. There's one obvious thing that we can point out in this chart. Give you a hint, it's down here somewhere. So yes, it's special cause because there's a point below the lower control limit. So we've got a special cause system. So now that we know that special cause, we are going to want to investigate that because our process is out of control. And that's exactly the way that we should be reading this chart. But what if I had a goal associated with that chart? So let's say our goal is to be at 85% or over, so somewhere in that green area. Because we're above the target, we could easily miss the fact that we're in a special cause situation and not react to this point as we should. So despite being green, our process is actually going out of control and we need to figure out why. So here's another example. This graph is looking at the number of complaints that occurred on a unit in a single month. So we've got the upper limit here that's around 14, and the lower limit actually doesn't exist. It would be below that have a negative number of complaints, we'll treat zero as basically the lowest value that we can have. So this is a common cause system. There's no special cause in it. We can expect the data to be anywhere between this upper control limit and zero in any given month. It's just going to vary randomly. But let's say here, let's say we've established a goal that we want to be eight or less for the number of complaints on our unit per month, and it's something we're looking at improving. Well, you'll notice that there's three points here that tend to stick out like a bit of a sore thumb. So although we've already established that this is a special cause system, or a common cause system, there's a good chance we might treat these three points as special cause. We might expend resources to go out and track down 
why we've got a higher number of complaints on our unit in this given month. So we'd be doing exactly what Laura was saying about tampering, we'd be going and trying to find a root cause for something that's just random chance. It's like if I handed you a dice and said, here, roll it, and you happen to roll a six, and I went out and tried to discover why you rolled a six, there's no reason it wasn't a one or a two that month. It's just totally random. So what does that mean for us as a system and how we might improve as we go forward? Well, here's a real world example that I think illustrates this concept pretty well. So here's a dashboard that could be seen in any healthcare system in the world, and that's quite fine. I'm definitely not trying to say this is wrong. Hopefully this, through this example, though, I'll show you how we might be able to make it even better. So we're going to look at two specific measures, the third next available appointment and the patients receiving perfect evidence-based care. So based on this dashboard, you'll notice that third next available appointment was red, but now it's green. So that's probably a cause for celebration. So that's a good thing. Maybe I want to go in and I want to take that group out for lunch and say, you know what, you've done some great work. Congratulations on finally meeting target. But this work that's being done around perfect evidence-based care, unfortunately, these guys are still red. So I might want to go in there as a leader and I would probably walk in and try and figure out why they're not achieving target and what I can do to try and motivate them to get better. But let's say we looked at that a little differently. So here's that third next available appointment group again. So remember, I'm going to take them out for lunch. I'm going to celebrate that they're doing a good job. But what if I showed you their data over time and put it in a control chart? Well, I see a system that's just totally common cause variation. So we just happen to take some measurements on months where it was a little bit lower, so they were red. And we happen to take a measurement on a month where they were a little bit higher, so it was green. Their process is going to be randomly red or green unless they do something to change that process. And we're either going to continue celebrating if it's green and maybe giving them a little bit of a motivational speech if they're red, but it won't actually have mattered. Unless they're doing something to change this process, it's going to be totally random. But we're not going to get that just by looking at our dashboard. What about that group that's doing, uh, working on percent of patients receiving perfect care? They've been red for a while here, and I was going to go in and try and motivate them, because that's what I would want to do as a leader, get them to do their best. But what if I showed their data over time and controlled them? Well, I think I would still want to go in and talk to them, but honestly what I would want to do is go in and talk to them about how they've done this work and figure out what I can replicate from them, because they were down here, common cause, but only about 50% perfect care. But then they did some improvements, and they changed their process, and they were about 75% perfect care. But now they've got special cause out of that system, and they're down up here around 90%. So if this continues for a little bit longer, we probably have a new system where this would be common cause up here. So even though they're not quite at the target that we've set for them, they've probably done some incredible work to get from at 50% to around 90%. So instead of going in there and trying to give them a motivational speech, I should maybe be taking them for lunch and trying to understand what they've been doing. So if we look back at that dashboard, it does show a pretty good snapshot of our system at one point in time, but it has a really hard time conveying what's happening over time. So as such, there's definitely some room for improvement, I think. So what if we did something that looks a little bit like this? So these are those exact same measures that were on that dashboard, but we show them all over time. So here's that group of people working on uh, best practice, best uh, perfect care. So we see special cause in their system and the data over time, and that's a good thing. Here's another area where we're seeing special cause, and this is our average length of stay. So we see special cause of a shift down here, but it's in a lower direction, so this is good. So we're giving more people perfect care, we're seeing our length of stay go down. Look over here, our monthly revenue is showing a shift, so we're actually making more money because we're doing this. So you know what, I think we're doing great. Oh, but over here, we've got some special cause around unplanned readmission. So that's not predictable anymore. There's some special cause going on that we're going to have to dig into because even though we're improving in some things, maybe it's having some unplanned effects that I might not see if I just looked at a snapshot. I've also got special cause of two out of three and a point outside the limits in my employee satisfaction. So despite the fact that we're doing some really good things for patients, maybe we're doing that at the expense of our staff. We can't predict if they're going to be enjoying their job day to day. So that may eventually have a different effect on this monthly revenue if there's more sick time or there's more turnover because we're not treating our staff very well. So looking at our data over time and being able to identify special cause, I think adds a whole new level to what we can learn from those dashboards of just the red or green. So at this point, we'd like to check back in with you and see if there's any questions or if you've got any thoughts on how this might relate to your work now, we'd be 
quite happy to hear them or talk through any issues that you have. Um, also, if you look at this slide deck once it goes up on the website, we do have some slides in here on how to make run charts in Excel. And if you are interested in how to make control charts in Excel or to do them by hand, which you can, it's a bit of a process, you have to do some math, but we can do a future QI Power Hour on how you actually select the type of chart you want and then how you go about building it, if people are interested. So there will be a poll opening at the end of this QI Power Hour. And if that's something you're interested in, maybe just write that in the comments of, yeah, I think it would be valuable to spend 40 minutes determining how I select the right chart and then how I would actually go about making it. So today was more about how you read it and how you understand the chart, but if you want to learn how to make it, that's something we'd absolutely be happy to do. So thank you, Audrey, for the, the vote of confidence already. So thanks. But yeah, any questions or thoughts on this stuff, we'd be happy to have a bit of a discussion with the time we have remaining. So we have a question. If we just want to analyze the situation and we don't have any prediction, how can you establish the three sigma limits? So you establish those limits based upon the data that you have. So I mean, if you just want to analyze the situation and you don't want to use sigma limits at all, you can use a run chart, use the run chart rules, and that'll show you if there's uh, random variation or non-random variation in your process, which is a good signal of change, and run charts are really good at that. But if you want to be able to establish prediction of if your system is going to be able to re repeat the results it's producing, that's when you'd want to use uh, three sigma limits and make it into a control chart. You would need 12 data points in order to establish your trial limit with control charts. If you have uh, less than that, stick with the run chart until you have enough. Sure. So, um, there is a program that we've been using here at HQC that's called QI Charts. Uh, it's not particularly expensive, it's just a macro that goes in Excel. And basically, once you have your data in Excel, you can select it and it'll do all the heavy lifting for you. As long as you know what type of chart you want to make, then it'll do it. So that's the big key to control charts, is knowing the right type to pick for the type of data that you have. Another question on when setting a target, is it a good idea to use the lower limit as the target? I don't know. It might need to elaborate on that a little bit more. I guess it depends on the yeah. project. I would say it totally depends on the project or what you're trying to improve. So if you're trying to improve the process of its patient experience scores, you definitely wouldn't want to set it arbitrarily as your lower limit. I think you'd want to use your expert knowledge of the process to say, where's the thing we want to be or where do we think is achievable once we do a few PDCAs, and set that as your target and then reevaluate. To move towards the lower limit, I guess. Yeah. Your wanting to go down with your data. No. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, another question about when to use the median versus the mean for the center line. So when we're using a run chart, we use a median, uh, and when we're using a control chart, we use the mean, just based on the mathematics that um, were used to develop the control chart. And again, if you do install that macro uh, in the charts for your Excel, it will do the heavy lifting for you and calculate your mean without you even having to do it. So yeah, it's really quite straightforward to use. Actually, I'm going to go back to Larissa's question. So uh, I guess I'm assuming from that she's, you know, if count is good in her process and, you know, maybe to rephrase that question in my mind is, can you set a target to create a new process? You know, and uh, I, I think it's a fair question, but how you use control charts to set targets or to understand um, the, data that you have. the data that you have. I don't know if that's what you meant, Larissa, but kind of how I'm interpreting that. Yeah, yeah. and honestly, I, I think the best practice for looking at control charts is usually to read the chart first and see if you have special cause or common cause and then to compare that to your target. But I think I would do it the opposite way at the start of it, is I might set a target of where I want to be in this process, and then I would create the control chart based upon what my data is telling me. So I would know if my uh, target is achievable, basically through random cause variation, if I'm sometimes going to be there and sometimes not, then I'd want to work to uh, improve the process so that I'm always achieving common cause variation that's at my target level. But if my target is in a special cause situation, like if it's outside my control limit, that's fine, it just might mean I need to do a lot more work or totally redesign the process in order to have it be a common cause situation that's always hitting that target. So that's how I would look at it. I'd probably set the target first 
and then I would build the chart based on what my dad is telling me, because that's how you have to do it. But then I would read the chart first for special cause, and then compare it to my target after. So. Do we have any more questions? There's no more questions at this time. Our email addresses are on this slide. Um, and Doug's going to open a poll after you all to finish at the end of this. But feel free to uh, shoot us any more questions that you might have. We're more than happy to answer them and help you in any way that we can. Yeah. Yeah, if you're trying to do this and you're starting to build charts, if you've got QI charts or you have some other macro that you use, but you're having trouble with it, we'd be happy to do a WebEx or walk you through it. Or if there is interest in people learning how to make these things for themselves so that they can use them, uh, this is absolutely something we would consider doing for another QI Power Hour. So, Just a note, we did a little run through of this yesterday at HTC, and someone asked a question I think might actually be pretty relevant. They really liked it, but it was like, how would I start showing this to leaders, or how would I start doing this? I think what we sort of decided upon around that table was, if you want to start building this into the way you're displaying data in your region or in your clinic, is I would start slowly, essentially. Um, people are used to seeing the data in the way they're used to seeing it. I wouldn't take that away from them and just start putting everything up in a control chart. But if people are used to looking at a dashboard or red or green, that's okay. Keep that there. But then maybe show them one chart that's in a control limit and explain why the value of that's there of data over time. And basically from the learnings that we've gone through, with, we've I went to Intermountain for learning. We've learned from Brandon Bennett from IHI. We've learned from Sandra Murray, who's a private consultant, but she works from IHI. And basically what they've taught us is that as you continue to show people data that's over time and they can understand what the control limits, they'll stop asking for that dashboard of red or green. They'll want the better data that's in the control limits. You just have to walk them along that process slowly. So that's a good note on how to do it. Just don't take everything they're used to away and say, here, this is how we're doing stuff now. So do it slowly and understand help people understand why it's important. So yeah, if there's no more thoughts or questions, the poll is open, and we'll probably sign off on the conference call, but we'll leave the poll open for a few minutes so that you can fill it out. So thanks a lot, and okay. enjoy your long weekend. Happy long weekend. You will be